you are live. Good evening and thank you for joining us again in Taking Flight, our beginning beekeeping course that we've been giving here at the LTV studios here in East Hampton. This is now our fifth lesson that we're going to be going over how to install your nuke. This is number five. Five, Say, yep. Yeah, number five. <laughs> oh, people, this is going to be interesting now. Okay. So <laughs> now we supposedly we're on lesson four, but I've got lesson five for you tonight. <laughs> so that's the, this is, this is life in the big leagues here. Are you serious? This is jazz. Uh, this is jazz, my man. Yeah, baby. Well, you know what? That's why, that's why I'm a master beekeeper, not a beginner. Okay. Uh, this, this one. But we're going to have a, uh, we've got a great, great class tonight where we're going to be talking about installing your nuke and then doing some inspections as per the, the follow-ups with that. Um, but I believe there were some questions from last week. If um, you could uh, yeah. read them so, for me, Jason. Yeah. All right. So I got a three-parter question, okay? It's from Buzz in the Springs. <laughs> Uh, that's the springs, not springs. So how do you know when an additional frame needs to be added to the hive? That's the first question. So let's just, you want to go over that one first? Yeah, that, that's fine. How do I know when I need to add more, more room for my bees? I have what I call the 70% rule. And the 70% rule means that when you look into your beehive, when you actually look into the box itself and you see bees filling seven or more frames in a 10 frame box like this that's 70 percent of that box is filled with bees at that point in time you would add yet another box in okay now i got one more when are the bees the most active time of day temperature rain or sun so i guess when are they on average the most uh, active Okay, bees, bees in general will fly anywhere from 50 degrees up until about 90 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. But their, their sweet spot, so to speak, is in the 65 to 80 degree uh, temperature range. And typically, they like to have a lot of sunshine. They don't like a lot of wind, because if you remember, they're only three quarters of an inch long and 11 knots of wind is gonna significantly slow them up. So they like sunshine, not so much wind, and a lot of raindrops are kinda of like you and I, they like to hide from that rain and they'll stay in, in at home, but thank you. Okay, and uh, how do I keep bees, how, how do bees keep from freezing when it's below freezing for weeks? That's the last question of that three-parter. That, that's actually, it's actually a great question. How do cold-blooded animals like honeybees keep themselves warm throughout the, the uh, winter months? And I like to actually use the analogy of us being in a crowded pub, okay? Because when you have a lot of people in a crowded pub, there's a lot of hot air going on, right? And that exhaling of breath actually keeps everybody in that room hot and then some. With honeybees, what we, we call it the clustering behavior. And what that is, is that's where the bees actually come right close next to each other and literally have layers of bees on each other. And by being this close, what happens is just by breathing, they keep that ambient area very warm. In fact, they actually keep the area right by where the queen is up to 93 degrees Fahrenheit, almost all winter long. But as you get towards the outer edge of it, it starts to get cooler. So where the guys out on the very, very edge of that, that uh, cluster are only slightly over 55, 60 degrees. Neat part about this is that the bees are very altruistic. And what that means is what the guys that are on the innermost sanctum in the 93 when they're kind of like Miami and the guys out on the outer edge here, what happens is they rotate and they actually rotate in layers so that the guys that are on the outside start to come on the inside and the guys in the inside come out. 
So they rotate continuously, and by doing so, they actually keep the whole area where the cluster of bees is warm. I'd like to add that the bees don't warm the whole hive. They actually warm only where they are. But because of all the bees, typically uh, an overwintering hive has about anywhere from four to six pounds of bees, which is somewhere on the order of 20 to 30,000 bees overwintering. These bees, okay, generate a lot of heat. And that heat actually does rise. And oftentimes you can actually see some moisture on the upper inner cover of a beehive because of all that heat that, that comes on up. But thank you so much for that, those series of questions there. So I'd actually like to just get into tonight's uh, conversation. And tonight's conversation, if I could have the next uh, slide, please. Okay, that's just me. You stuck with me at North Fork Promised Land Apiaries. If you want to get a hold of me, you can get my email at beekeeper1 at optimaonline.net. Um, I'd tell you that you could call me, but I'd be lying because I'm hearing impaired, and if, if uh, I don't hear cell phones ring, it's a beautiful thing. I have a love-hate relationship with phones. But let's go to the next slide. Okay. This is the beginning of beekeeping lesson, lesson number five. So yours truly is talently challenged, okay? Let's go to the next one. This is about installing your nuke and, and, um, and the follow-up inspections of what you're going to do in that, that beehive. When we talk about installing a nuke, a nuke is simply a term that we use in beekeeping that's basically a starter beehive. A starter beehive consisting of up to five or six frames of bees, brood, and when we talk about brood, we're talking about the young. The young are the eggs, the larvae, and the pupae, the sealed, sealed uh, um, cells of, of brood. And then, of course, you have what we call a mated queen. When we do that, we can place that five frame nuke into something like this, which is a, which is a, a 10 frame uh, Langstroth hive. You can do either 10 frame or eight, eight frames in, in on that. And then following the ins installation of this, these bees in there, you can go ahead and do your follow up inspections. If I could get the next slide, please. Okay. We're going to go to that, that video that we have of putting, putting a nuke into a, uh, actually putting bees into a nuke box. Now, I want to clarify this because it's not quite straight the same as what you're going to do in, the, in your nuke installation with your beehives. What this is, this is a demo of where we had a swarm of bees at the airport teaching facility and we put those bees into the nuke box. I'm gonna show this video and then we're gonna go from that because then now you'll have a nice reference point of what a nuke box looks like, the amount of bees that you're gonna be seeing in that kind of box. And then I'm gonna demonstrate via this, this box what it looks like to actually take those frames into the full-size hive and what you can expect afterwards. So Jason, if we could have that right. video, please. Rolling in right now.
and you're back. Thank you so much. So what part of what I want to explain to you about there is when I put that swarm, I took that swarm of bees and put it in a box that we call a nuke box, which is what you're going to actually get. What happens after that is I allowed those bees to stay within that nuke box and get themselves established for a couple of weeks. Once they were established, we then transfer them into a full-size hive like this 10 frame, frame hive. Now, I, I wanna show you here, this hive is set up. Hopefully your hive at home will be already set up. You have a stand that, that set up that, that, that is stable and sturdy and the hive can stand on. You have your bottom board, you've got your box, and then you have your lid here on, on top. Now, when you get ready for your nucleus colony to come in, you're getting five frames. But when I do with a 10 frame, I tend to like to take yet an extra frame out. So I, only ha I actually have only four frames in. Because when you take your live bees and frames in, you're gonna want some extra room to actually place them in. Probably the most important thing to remember with regard to the installation of your nuke is whatever order you take your frames out is exactly the way you're gonna put them in. So what happens is in your first frame that you, you took out from your nuke box like this, if it was on the left side, then you're going to put it right in closest to you and work forward on that. All right, it doesn't matter to me which way you take the frames out, from left to right or right to left. What really does matter is please keep them in exactly the order that you take them out from the nuke box into your main box. Now it's very easy, you then just taking a frame at a time and you place them, place them in. You don't have to look for your queen, okay? In fact, I'd prefer you not to because really the bigger deal here is you're transferring, you're completely confusing your bees from their little box into basically a new home. So it's actually much, much easier and much more important that you actually smoothly, fluidly take the frames from the nuke box into your main hive. And when you hold the frame, you like to hold the frame with the, the thumb and index finger, nice and solidly, okay? When you bring it up and out of that box, you take it up and out straight Try not to shake too bad, because I know it'll be your first time doing it, all right? But then you place it in, and I like to create, you see, I like to actually have a little space initially, and then you can just slide it on over, okay? So now, once we have all of that in, we have our fifth frame in, I now have one whole space. And in there, what I like to do is then I move the frames over and put the last put the last one in so this way i i mitigate and minimize the idea that i might actually crush the queen in the in the hive now in the event your bee your nuke box has lots and lots of bees in it what you can do is you can take that whole box and you're going to do exactly what your mother told you never to do okay and that is you're gonna bang the bees right out of the box. It's a sharp, quick action where you would turn the box upside down, bang, right onto the top board. You're not going to hurt the bees, I promise you. And the only problem that's gonna get hurt is your ego because you're gonna think, hey, I'm gonna hurt them, and no, you're not going to, all right? It's a quick action. There may be some bees left in the box. It's not a sweat. What I do is I take that box, and I place it down in the ground in front, of the, uh, in front of the beehive, okay? Now, the next thing that you do is you're going to take this cover, you're gonna put this cover back on. And when you put this cover, you notice how it has a hole like this. If you want, you can feed your bees 
with a, a mason jar, 32 ounce mason jar right from here. And you can place a second deep box like this, empty, no frames in it, right around it. And then you can cover it up with your outer cover. Those of you that have been taking my classes and are getting equipment from me, we actually use a slightly different feeder. So instead of this particular uh, inner cover, we have a whole top feeder that fits the exact perimeter of here and holds a whole gallon of liquid feed. Now the liquid feed that you're going to feed them is one to one sugar syrup. One, one cup of water, one cup sugar. What I like to do is I like to take a gallon of water, I bring it to a roaring boil, and then I take eight cups of sugar and pour it right in. I, I turn the heat right off once it's at that roaring boil, pour the eight, eight cups of sugar in, stir it, stir it, stir it, let it cool. Please don't put it on the bees hot, all right? So if um, those of you that are buying nukes from me, you're gonna get an email about seven to 10 days before their arrival. Only make your syrup no more than two days before they arrive. Okay, you wanna keep it fresh um, at that. And then what you're going to end up doing with that is, is you're going to be feeding those bees approximately a gallon to two gallons of one-to-one -one syrup for the next four weeks after that on it. Jason, if we could have the next slide, please. Okay. So now that you succeeded to get through installing your nuke, and I might add in this, at the East Hampton uh, Teaching Bee Yard, we are going to do a live demonstration of an installation of nukes prior to your nukes arriving. So you get to have a test, uh, test run with that. What I am gonna tell you, if you choose to come to the, the uh, demonstration, Please bring your bee gear. Please bring your smoker because I will put one or two nukes in, but I'm going to ask you to try and put one or two in at the at teaching yard because I want you to be as successful and as comfortable as possible for when your own bees arrive. Um, I hope that's good with you. Could we have the next slide? What I want to do right here is I'm going to go through a, a couple of slides of pictures so that you get an idea of how the hive should kind of look like through the course of the summer months. When we install in something like this here in May, this is what you're going to look like. You're going to have a single deep box. You're probably going to, this is actually taken just before I added the uh, top feeder on it. So you're going to actually have a single box your top feeder, and then that fancy little copper gabled roof there, like that. Um, this is what they'll, they'll start out with. It. Could I have the next one? Look at that same hive in July. They've now, if you take a look at the, the hives, they have three deep boxes and one medium super. That's a, those are big hives, and they were only started in July. Uh, in, I'm sorry, in May. So what you see is the reason I bring these two pictures together. If you could go back, Jason, go back with one for me, please. You see how small it looks. Please don't be deceived. One of the things I want you to understand is if we go to the next slide, is the, there is an exponential growth pattern that happens with the bees between May and July. And that's why you're going to be adding room. You're probably just a, a ballpark figure. You're probably going to add one full box like that once a month, May, June, July. Sometimes you get even a little bit more than that kind of room in the, those first couple of months. If I could have the next one, please. Okay, so this is what I want you to understand. The population dynamics of a beehive is really, really uh, important to understand. You are in the growth curve of your beehives from the time they show up right clear through to the longest day of the year, which is June 21st. After June 21st, they start a very slow but methodical kind of uh, decline. If I could have the, the next piece. 
It usually plateaus right around July 4th, and then it's kind of a steady dwindling. I can promise you right now, most of you that are starting are not going to notice that they are actually in a decline around July 4th. You're going to actually think, man, I've got all sorts of bees and they're still expanding. They actually aren't. They are a lot of bees, um, but they're not. Could I get the next? I want to go through this because it's real important to me to kind of give you waypoints for your growing season, but I like to work coming backwards. So in August 15th, we call it the transition time from the summer bees to the winter bees. We had the question, we had the question earlier, how do the bees make it through the winter? It's an absolutely fascinating study to understand that the bees actually are moving into winter in August and that they, the bees that come out in the late August time actually are physiologically slightly different than the ones that are in the summer. They're a little bit heavier, they have a little bit more hair, and then on, internally they actually have fat layers within them that help keep them a little bit warm. Could I have the next one, please? September 15th is when the end, what we call kind of the end of that downward dwindle of, of the hive. That's where it kind of stabilizes for what's going to um, make them through the winter. And it, the minimum that we look at is about four pounds of bees. That's roughly 16 to 18,000 bees in the hive. I'm going to tell you it's probably going to be north of that by another four to four to ten thousand bees. The next one, please. And then October 15th. Um, the reason I put this in here is as a beekeeper, you're going to start to notice a, a bit of difference in your hive. Up until October 15th, your bees look um, will look almost fluid. It will almost be like layers of bees going out. Around October 15th, we're starting to get some colder temperatures, and all of a sudden you're going to see it looks like the hive is starting to tighten up, and it is, because the bees are starting to get closer and stay closer together because of the, the temperatures of the, of the day. If I could have the next one, please. Okay, so here... I'm going to go through your beekeeping calendar for your first year. If I could have the next. After you install your nuke, you're going to put that top feeder on. You're going to feed them anywhere from four to six weeks on it with, the, with that one-to-one -one solution that we talked about. All your nukes are going to come treated for varroa, depending upon what type of material is used, if there is a mite strip in the nuke, you are going to lead that, leave that strip in there. If it is the, the um, what they call an apivore strip that stays in for 42 days. Could I have the next one, please? In your first inspection, I, I really want to come to this one. It's literally a week later, but I'm, what I want you to really understand here is at this point in time, please start your record keeping from the day that you install your bees. And what does that look like? That means when you go out to your beehive and either with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, start to look at your bees. That's the first thing I want you to really look at. Use your senses. Look at your bees and ask yourself the following questions. Is the bee's flight purposeful or lazy? And the question is asked, well, how do I tell the difference? Purposeful, the bees are kind of like JFK Airport, where they're coming in one after the other very quickly, okay? And in fact, the bees might look a little bit blurry to you at first because of, uh, you're not used to watching them land. If they look real lazy, which looks like they're just kind of floating through the air as they're coming in, that kind of, kind of thing gives you a very distinct different impression on it. So you want to actually know the difference on that. The next thing is, is you're going to observe the bees as they land and look and ask, is there any pollen coming in? And first off, you're going to say to yourself, I can't see pollen. But you can. Pollen is really brightly colored. 
It's very, it's in, it comes in a range of colors from white all the way to black uh, and in every color in between. And as you train your eye to watch the bees land, the bees that have pollen are kind of a little bit awkward because they're freight, freight load carrying bees. They can't quite um, move as quickly as a bee that doesn't have it. So it'll become quite apparent to you. The other thing that you want to do is start to look on what direction are these bees flying. Why do I ask all of that? Because you as the beekeeper, now we're starting a log of, for a year in, year out type of record keeping. And when you determine what's the direction, one of the lessons and one of the homework assignments you had as, as the beginning beekeepers is you had a site plan set up for where to put your bees. And in it, you were asked to actually go on Google Earth and say, what is in a one mile radius of my, my location? The reason for that is because 90% of your bees are going to fly within that, nine, that one mile radius. So if you get the direction of where your bees are going in that first week, you're gonna be able to say to yourself, okay, if it's, let's say they're going due north. If they're going due north and you go back onto your Google Earth map, you're gonna look in there and say, what do I see? Do I see a desert? Do I see, do I, uh, see trees? Do I see flowers? What is in that area? And you are going to start to learn to do something that I call following the bloom sequence in your area. If I could have the next one, please. All your inspections from first right to the last one of these, we do three things. The first and foremost is we always check for eggs and or the presence of the queen. I can guarantee you 99% of you are not gonna find the queen, but you can always find eggs within the cells of, of the frames, okay? The reason that's so important is we call it is the hive queen right. We know that in a beehive, there's only one fertile female in the entire hive, and that is the queen. If your egg laying machine is not there, your hive could be in serious trouble. That is why it's so important to always understand, I must establish if my hive is queen right. The second thing that you always want to check for, and you're going to start to learn it, is how do I assess my food reserves or food stores that are in, in the bee, beehive? And um, I'm just going to take a frame out for, for a, just a demonstration a deep frame like this, empty, weighs about a pound, pound and a half. But when it is full of honey and full of bees, it's anywhere from six to eight pounds. So what I'd like and suggest to you, right from the very first one, is you start to say to yourself, how heavy does it feel? That's what you say to yourself. You're not going to have a reference point. You're not going to know what 80 pounds of honey looks like. I do. You won't. And so what I want you to do is say right from the outset, is this light, moderate, or heavy? And how many frames do I have of that? What you will be able to tell in the comb itself is when you look at it, if it is a liquid, that is the nectar or the honey that is in the hive. If it looks like a colorful chalk, that's the pollen in the hive. And so when you start to assess it right from the first time you're in the beehive, when you start to assess it like that, what you're going to be able to do is say, I was in my hive, I found one frame that had a moderate amount of honey, and I saw a band of pollen that was the width of my pinky. Guess what? That's what you write down, because that's a, that's a, a waypoint for you on the, the first first time that you're looking at that. If you take a look at this in the second inspection, two weeks later, so now you're three weeks post installation. Look what I put down there. Be prepared to add a second super, okay? Sometimes I say and a queen excluder. Um, I'm gonna uh, refrain from that. I'd actually suggest 
Don't add the queen excluded just yet. All right, allow them to be free this way. Um, now, what I, I did mention here is this is that 70% rule. If I go back to my box right here, and we talked about the first five frames, that center frames that you put right in the center was what you started with. So all you're looking at is two more frames getting filled and added with bees. You see how quick that happens, all right? So when that happens like that, then you're going to want to say, I need to add another box. So in your preparation, in your equipment preparation, I want you to, at the very minimum, have your two deeps ready and built before your uh, nuke arrives. Have all your frames ready to, to rock and roll with, with that. If I could have the next one, please. Okay. Every time around, we're going to always be talking about that our goals tend to be the same. Queen right, nu nutrient levels. And then the third thing that we start to add in on this third inspection is, is diseases or pests. The single biggest one that we're going to look at is Varroa mites. Okay, we talked about that a bit during our disease and, and um, pest control type of time. And that, that is pretty much the biggest one. But what I like to say here is in your third inspection, which is again, now that's 30 days out from where, where you um, first installed your bees, we're starting to come into the onset of the main honey flow that comes out here uh, on Long Island, which is usually around Flag Day, which is June 14th. That can be earlier or later, depending upon the heat. That's why I like to follow the growing degree days. Growing degree days is the measure of heat units accumulated per day. And the, base, the rule of thumb is the quicker it happens or the hotter it is, the earlier that main honey flow is going to come, the cooler, the rainier kind of weather, the later that will come. So I've seen the main honey flow come as early as June 1st, and I've seen it come as late as June 30th. But the rule of thumb somewhere right around the 7th to the 20th. If I could have the next one, please. So in the fourth and fifth inspections, what's happening here is everything is a week apart. I like to have it as a seven day. Set yourself up a certain day or time that you're going to decide you're going to go ahead and inspect your beehive. Um, I find that by putting yourself with a routine like that, it will it really help establish what you're doing. And you're also going to be able to, in your record keeping, really start to monitor and see how quickly these bees are truly coming through their um, growth cycle. Okay, because everything that we've talked to up until this fifth inspection is on the growth side. Next one, please. In the sixth inspection, this is where you now have kind of, I'll call it, you've crossed over the line. Crossing over the line meaning now what has happened is your food sources, believe it or not, in July are actually in decline. Not dramatically, but they are in decline. So too is your uh, population curve with your bees. Your bees now have stopped growing and they're slowly declining. But here is really where the most important thing for you, the beekeeper, have to be aware of. Because they are in the decline stage, you're going to actually observe that the bees behaviorally will change. Instead of being the fuzzy wuzzy was a bear friendly, friendly animals, guess what? They get a bit more defensive and that defensive behavior actually starts to increase po uh, from, from July into August. And then, it, and then all of a sudden it goes away again. But in that July and August time, this is where you, the beekeeper, have to be really quite aware. If you have surplus honey from the, the honey flow, this is where, in the month of July, this is where you would be um, actually harvesting your honey. If I could have the next one, please. Okay. Now, I want you to notice here, 
Now, I'm now on the decline side of the, uh, of the growth curve. And now I actually, in, these month, in the month of July and August, I actually like to stretch out the number of days in between the inspections. I go from seven day to a 10 day. I actually rarely go to the 14 day. Um, I only do that when I actually, me personally, feel real comfortable with the, with the bees themselves. Um, the, the bees are definitely gonna be in this, what we call a honey dearth. In other words, the food coming in is gonna come down quite a bit. Um, but I, I wanna just do this reminder. The focal point of every inspection, the reason the why you're going in, is this my hive queen right? And what do my stores look like? What your stores look like become more and more important to you every time as we get later in the season. Why is that so? Because the bees are gonna need anywhere from 70 to 90 pounds of honey to make it through the winter. So what I wanna start to see is as I progress through the season, as the, the bees will reduce the amount of brood or young that they're rearing, but they'll actually add honey to the hive. So the hive is gonna get heavier, um, significantly heavier, to the point where you should have a problem with something like this 10 frame box, you actually should have a problem picking it up, okay? Now, um, one of the common questions that gets asked to me is, do I have to go through every frame of every box that I have on the beehive? And the answer to that is a resounding no, okay? A lot of times what I like to do, if I am in a beehive like this, where I'm in the middle of summer, where I have either two, two deeps and maybe even some extra, extra medium supers on it. If I am in a hive like that, what I do oftentimes is I can answer the questions, queen right, honey stores, or in pests and diseases, right in that second brood box. And often when I take it, when I inspect the hive, what I like to do is take an outer frame out right away and I'll place it on ear towards the hive stand and then I'll work those same questions. And the inspection of a frame is actually really quite quick because you take it, you look at the side that is towards you and in that you can actually make that assessment. Do I have brood on it? Brood is the eggs, the larvae and the pupae. Do I have pollen? That's that chalky material we talk on it. And then do I have honey? And the honey is very clear because it's a liquid. And then you can actually do that kind of assessment very, very quickly. Um, you do not need to go through every frame. You can, just, you can start with this one. I would suggest don't go any more than five frames in that inspection. Um, the only time I start to do a whole lot more than five frames out of a hive is A, I have a concern. That means the third part of it, I might have picked up something in that brood pattern that looked like disease or something that caught my eye that I said, this doesn't look right to me. Okay, so if I find that, then I'll spend a bit more time. Or let's just say I didn't find any eggs then I'm gonna go through a few more frames. But the moment, most of the time you're gonna find your eggs, you're gonna be finding those three points very, very quickly. If I could have the next one, please. Okay, now what happens now is, is the craziest part is you're at the end of July, starting into August, and you, the beekeeper, are gonna start your winter preparation. Hottest time of the year for us out here, and yet what you are doing is actually getting ready for, for winter. And what that is, is in the brood chamber, which is these big boxes, what you want to start to see is in the outer frames, you want to see most of them having mostly honey. Because if you'd like to think about it, is the outer frames, once they're filled with honey, that's like an insulating layer between the bees and the outer wall of the hive on top of being a food store. 
So what we're going to want to see is the outside filling up with honey. And as we go through the later inspection, that honey frame should get continually going towards the center. So that the second box that's in this, this uh, hive should weigh anywhere from 60 to 90 pounds. That's an awful lot of honey. You should, it, it should feel hard to pick up. Could I have the next one, please? When you get down here, when we start to get closer towards the end of August, in, in Long Island conditions, what we, we tend to have to do, we tend to have to do an early fall feeding of our bees. And what I like to do is I like to do that same one-to-one -one sugar syrup solution. And then I like to add this supplement called Honey Bee Healthy. Um, let, me, let me be very clear. There is actually no <laughs> scientific data that it actually does anything positive. I liked it because it, it, it does have some essential oils. It smells really good. And so I, I add it in. You use it at its labeled rate. And I've just found that what it does seem to do is it does seem to induce the bees to eat that syrup. And sometimes what we do is we do add about a half of a uh, half of a bar of what we call a pollen supplement. The pollen is the protein in the diet of the, of the bees. And it's really easy because if you add that half a bar of, uh, of uh, pollen supplement and the bees eat it, they're telling you a story. They're telling you they need it. But if they don't touch it, guess what? Just leave it there. They'll, they'll use it when they actually need it. If I could have the next one, please. In this, I, I want to just back up for just a second because one of the things I would, would like to say is at the end of July, this is probably the most important time for you, the beekeeper, to test for Varroa, to actually know what your Varroa mite counts are at and whether you are at what we call treatment level. If you are at treatment level, then you must be able to use the right material to treat for these, these pests. Very important because you want to keep the mite level low so that the, when they do the transition into winter bees, those winter bees are as healthy as possible to come in. And then when you get into kind of the end, somewhere around that end of August type of time, one of the things I like to do is a true evaluation of my queen in that beehive. And what does that mean? First, I like to visually, I actually like to find her. At that point, I want to be able to look at her. I want to say, is she intact? What does she look like? Does she have damaged wings, damaged uh, legs, anything like that? If I have a queen that has a defect, I will actually replace the queen. Um, if, I, if I notice no uh, visual defects, then I go to a second thing where I actually qualitatively evaluate what, are the, what is her brood pattern like. When we talk about brood pattern, we talk about two things. One is what's the quantity? Quantity is simply how many of these frames are filled with brood? The second is a qualitative thing, where when we look at the frame, we want to see that the queen's pattern, actually almost all those cells have either eggs, larvae, or sealed brood. If it looks like a, what we call a solid pattern, that's a queen that's laying a very good egg laying pattern. If it looks like scatter shot, looks like almost a uh, shotgun layer, that creates a question for me. So that's, that's when I, I do that. That kind of an inspection, I would say to you, comes to you by the end of August. Because if I need to do a radical change, meaning I need to change the queen out, now's the time to do it. Could I have the next one, please? Okay, um, if you've placed your queen excluder on, it's really important. 
I put this in almost as much to remind myself as to remind you, is if you have the queen excluder on, you must get that off. Because remember that the queen excluder is exactly what it is. It restricts the ability of the queen to move around within the beehive. If it's on in the cold weather, she's not going to be able to come through that queen excluder when the, all the other bees are moving up through it, okay? Also, the thing we often add in the, in the fall time is an upper entrance to the beehive. The idea of this upper entrance is to do two things. One is to help for that removal of moisture when the bees are in that tight cluster and that hot air is floating up the moisture can come out from that upper hole. Second thing is on occasion, we do get some significant snowfall and in that snowfall, sometimes the lower entrance actually gets plugged up. So you've given them a space where they can come out. The other thing that does change is in these fall feedings is you actually go to two to one. This is a very heavy syrup. It's the equivalent of eight to 10 pounds of, of sugar per gallon. It's a real, real heavy mix, but it's easy for the bees to digest, easy for them to convert into, into the uh, cells, and it, it really does help you. What, what happens here is, is that you want to be able to feed your, uh, give your bees feeding right up till about Columbus Day. And I will say this, this year, we actually got a little fooled because it was a lot warmer right into November. So you have to gauge what your weather's doing. If your weather stays warm, stick with it. Keep feeding them. Keep it, keep it going into November. If it's cold, you're going you're gonna to back off on that. On it. So your hive should weigh anywhere from 120 to 150 pounds at, that, at this point in time. If I could have the next one. Pre-winter, okay, at this point in time, what ends up happening is if you've done everything according to your plan now, the only thing you need to do is, I actually, in, if, if I've got a area where I've got deer coming through or I've got some kind of uh, wind conditions, I actually use small uh, moving straps and, and ratchet it right around the entire hive to the stand itself. And then um, I actually like to put a rock right up on top of the lid. Uh, I have a, a client in Bridgehampton where we put a cement block on top of the lid of the beehive. And in that last windstorm that came through that with 60 knots of wind, believe it or not, it actually blew the lid with that cement block off. So. We said, guess what? Let's add a strap. This way it doesn't happen again. Okay? If I have the next one, please. And that's your year in beekeeping after you've installed your, your uh, nuke. I'm happy to take any questions that come out. I have I'm a few not questions. getting bees from oh, you. I'm getting them um, in a box. And I'm getting mine, I think, around the end of April. Is that about the same time you're going to be putting yours in? So I can kind of figure out the timing. Well, now, now you, you say, say a box. box. Um, uh, I'm getting three pounds of bees. Okay, okay so, so you're, you're getting, getting a package of bees. A package of bees, which is very, um, that's, that's different from the nuke. Okay, so you're going you're gonna to be faced with some different challenges. Okay, um, and you're going to have to be very mindful uh, of, of that. The process is actually remarkably closer to, uh, to the same um, on it. Uh, yes, your nuke is, your package is coming very close to the same time uh, nukes are. The difference is the trajectory that's going to happen for you. What, because what happens is with the nukes, they come with the brood in all stages. So they're, they're kind of in their high, you know, go gear. In your package, when you install, have you installed the package before? No, never. Okay, because you're going to want to really, first, first so I want to recommend, recommend really follow a couple of um, uh, YouTube 
package installations because because the, the really your important thing is after you've taken that sugar can uh, out you got to find your queen which is in the cage don't release her right then whatever you do don't release her because remember that's an artificial swarm okay and in it so when you when you do it you're going to do the same thing we did you're going to i would i would definitely remove five frames of, of, of out of your box shake your bees in bang 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 bang, bang. same all that's the same difference is you got that queen in your cage right in your pocket don't put it in your pants pocket don't put it on the ground because you're going to lose her okay put that and then you're going to take that queen cage and you're going to part these two frames and slide that cage so that the if my finger is that cage and this top is that screen that screen fits right down like that okay I like to do it so that with that queen cage the the cage gets pinched between the two top bars okay I, that's my just the way I do it um, that's probably your most important thing second thing for you you better have that feed on them okay get the feed on them and then I would reduce this entrance to the smallest hole, okay? And then you're going to feed, your, your feeding is probably going to be nine weeks, something along that. You're probably, you know what I'm saying? Because you're about, you're, you're three to four weeks behind what a nuke comes. Sorry, that was such a long-winded answer. But that, <laughs> no, 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 no. I've been, I've been watching the videos. I don't know whether I should just directly dump them, indirectly dump them. No, no, direct, direct dump. dump. Direct, direct, direct dump. dump. Don't, don't, don't do indirect at all, okay? Everybody you get, you want to put as many of them right in here. And, and just like the nuke box, you're just going to put the cage down here. It's an actually quite a, um, uh, I wish I could get you uh, do a demo before because it's really important how you bang them actually a sharp motion okay it's not it's not mr friendly cur you know courteous time yeah 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 um and it, that part is really important because what you're going to see i can't believe bees can actually cling to plastic and they can cling to little little screens and you can't get them out okay just i'm sorry to interrupt to spray them with a the little sugar syrup first or do you i mean what do you i mean i i almost never do I understand, now, now, now mind you, having said that, remember I've been keeping bees for 50 years, okay? So I'm not the brightest tool in the shed. Okay? But the thing is, it's the idea behind uh, the sugar syrup is you actually coat them lightly, um, and in the coating lightly like that, it kind of reduces the number of flyers and things like that. I think it's probably gonna calm you down a little bit. If you do that, Please be light with it. I've had people drown them. Yes. Uh, maybe a suggestion: Should we try to get maybe one or two of those packages for the airport, so we have something to demonstrate? It's, we plan on doing that on May seventh. If Michael wanted to come along and well, May, May May seventh is nukes. Package packages usually come a little bit earlier. Um, I'm happy to. Uh, you know what? I'm happy to go see if I can get a package or two. Um, uh, um, uh, be, I think so April 27th or something like that. The ship, ship, yeah. ship date. My ship date is between, I think, the, the last weekend of April. And how long can they stay in the package for? It, it, you got to get them out. You got to get them out because probably, probably when they show up, they're going to be just about at the end of there. Where are you getting them from? Uh, Mountain Sweet? Yeah, uh, it might be Mountain. Mountain Sweet out of Georgia? Yeah, it might be, or it was somebody, you know, I can't They're real good. I'm no, just, uh, I'm just going to tell you, Michael. They're, they're very good. Right, and I had the big, I had bought the big feeder, so the, the, the large one. Feeder. Yeah, the whole good. top feeder. You're, yeah, because you're going you're gonna to want to feed them. You, you definitely, right. the, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Would it be possible to get a list of every other little thing that we need? Like, I saw that you see, I didn't know, I don't know whether my package is coming with, uh, mite strips? No. So I would have to get those? Uh, no. Um, you're different, okay? 
you knew that anyhow. But yeah, um, actually, actually, the the interesting part with the packets in terms of treating, they're actually quite a bit easier to treat. Um, there are two recommendations. One of which is once after you've installed them, let a let a few days go by, and you can do an oxalic acid vapor treatment. Okay, because Oxalic acid works very, very well on open, uh, uh, open bees without sealed brood. So that's actually a good, good, good one. Word of caution, oxalic vape, uh, acid vapors don't inhale. Okay, they're very dangerous. Um, but there's also something called an oxalic acid dribble, and that's where you mix in oxalic acid on a, on a syrup. Um, and some people have used that on the um, on the uh, the packages as well. Um, best. Uh, let me give you a website to refer to. It's the Honey Bee Health Coalition. It's www.hbch or something. Something. Okay. Look them up. They've got great demonstration videos on this. Great ones. Okay. Really, really talented. Anybody else? You got a question? I have a question. Okay. okay. So it sounds to me like there's only a short period that you're not doing the liquid feed in July and August, and otherwise, or when, when do you No, it's the actually, it, it can be quite a bit longer than that. Um, what I'm asking you to be is mindful of the idea that you've got you've to evaluate your food stores. And I actually like to work with numbers, in other words, whole numbers. So in other words, if I have a frame that is just nothing but honey in it, I'll, I'll say I've got one frame of honey, okay? But if I have two frames, then, I, then I'll make a mark, okay? I've got two. And the reason I do that is because this gives me an idea. If two out of 10 frames have honey, I have a percentage in my head already of how much food stores. The more that food stores goes, moves towards 100% in that, not the first box, the second box, okay? The more it's closer to that, then I have a way to gauge, do I need to feed like what you're talking about in August or what I'm seeing is a progression that they keep filling more and more? You don't need, exactly, yeah, yep, exactly. When they do that first, you know, when they, it starts to fill up, that's when I back off. I don't feed them anymore. About and four weeks. Wait, about four okay. weeks after your nuke arrives, you're, you're probably going to back off. And this is, again, this, unfortunately, there's the, what I'll call the science of beekeeping and the art of beekeeping. And unfortunately, feeding bees stands more in the art side of it than the science of it. Here's what I'm going to say to you. Be like my, my mom was Italian, okay? She fed everybody, okay? So, so, so the idea is you're not gonna be a negative feeding. Let me, let me also put one other thing that I am coming more, um, more to uh, terms with now. I think more and more the first year you have your bees, plan on being that Italian mom feeding and don't plan on taking honey. Okay, uh, you know what, um, it, it's too easy, it's actually too easy to take too much honey and then the bees have nothing back in on, okay? It's a lot better looking at live bees in the spring than dead ones, okay? Any other questions? Yes. If you don't take honey, will they be less cranky in July? No. Okay. Yeah. No, unfortunately, that that doesn't that doesn't change on that one um, on it. But we'll we're gonna cover in terms of the mechanics of inspection um, that I'm gonna ask you guys to actually all take your you know phone out, put your timer on for seven minutes, and learn the discipline of uh, doing the three point identification in seven minutes. Because if you learn that in the early part of the season, it's going to pay dividends when they get cranky in July. Because you're going to know how to move through the hive because you did it in those early parts. So 
So that was seven minutes per hive? That's correct. All right. Yeah. 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 Anytime. Anytime. They, basically what happens is if you're in a beehive more than seven minutes, think of you, what you're doing is you're disrupting the entire inner workings of the hive. And it goes up on a logarithmic base. Uh, no, I, I'm using the wrong word. But it goes up astronomically. Every minute after, after exponentially, yeah. Because after seven minutes, what happens is you start, you've already set them back something on the order of two hours. But every minute after seven minutes, you're adding another hour that they're disrupted. So if you're in there 15 minutes, guess what you just did? Train wreck for the day. You effectively set them back a whole day. That's what I want you to think about in terms of your invasion of inspection. All right. Yes. A bunch of questions. But a I'll bunch. Try and keep okay. Them. <laughs> Go. Um, in, in a scenario that you're you're stung and you feel like unsafe, what, what do you do? Like you don't run. What do you do? <laughs> wait, wait. Say if that again. If you are getting stung and you start to feel unsafe, what's your recommendation? Okay. So, so the question what? is: is if you are getting stung and you feel unsafe, you actually brought up a really great thing. It does happen on occasion. Okay. I'm not saying it's going to happen to you. It might not even happen this year. What I like to do, this is the first thing before I ever even go in a bee yard, to make sure I have an escape route. Okay, that's an honest thing. If you get in a scenario where you feel unsafe and you are getting stung, this is what I say to do. Put the lid right back on the hive. I don't care how many frames you have out. Put the lid back on the hive and walk out. Get out of the bee hive until you can actually, because if you're all kind of nervous, you know, all kind of amped up, guess what, you're, you're actually perspiring and at that point in time, you're, you got a sign on you that says, I am scared to death, okay? But really the bees are actually sensing that. And sometimes what happens is, let's say you are getting stung. And uh, I've actually seen it with beginners where they've had the gloves on and they don't recognize that the bees are actually stinging these gloves. And what happens is that after a while, you can almost smell the banana because that's what the, the alarm pheromone smells like. And then all of a sudden they realize, oh my goodness, I got a whole bunch of bees and they get scared, all right? It's much easier to walk out of the bee, bee yard and come back, because guess what? You're just gonna be calmer and you'll move smoother. Great question. I don't wear them, okay, um, on it. I, uh, look, I, I think for a beginner, you know, I, I think really use a high quality leather glove. And I'm gonna say this to you. Um, I know uh, Bruce at Agway and Riverhead carries them, put them on. It's like a piece of clothing. Make sure they're comfortable, okay? That's really, because the trouble with the gloves is you lose dexterity, okay? It's just another, another layer, and you don't think that that is being much, but take a look. You don't have a lot of room here, okay? So you add, you know, a big old mitt on this thing, and you start trying to pull that out. That becomes, you know, a little bit cumbersome on that, okay? Yes? SHB yes. traps? Small high beetle traps. Okay, okay, that's, that's a, a pest. That, that, yes, absolutely. Um, you need two per hive, and they're about three bucks a piece. Um, the traps, anything else that we, for pest control that we in would term, In terms of pest control, those are the big two. The big, the big two. Everybody else after that, you're probably going to be calling me up. Okay, that's probably really really happens all the time, Michael. You know what I mean? Um, but it does take a trained eye to understand. You know, if, uh, and really probably the biggest thing with that is, is actually brood evaluation. That's where most, actually not just beginners, I know some very experienced beekeepers that don't pick it up, okay? It, it does take a trained eye. Yes. yes. What is a, bee, a queen excluder? The queen excluder is literally a wire frame that fits the fits right over the top of a of a, uh, a box, and the idea behind it is is that 
you, if you restrict where the queen goes, only honey can go above that, no brood. Okay, that's, that's the idea. And the idea behind that is sometimes that um, with the queen, she'll lay in both this first box and your second box. I personally don't mind that, okay? I personally like that. I like the freedom of not having the excluder on initially. But come into August, I like to, or actually, I, I like, come July, I don't mind putting that on above the second box because now I've, what I've created is a layer that the queen can no longer come up and through. But the other benefit to that is that the bees actually don't like going through that wire redu reducer. So what they do is they start to store the honey into that second box, which is right where you want them. So you already automatically started in July your winter planning. Yes, sir. Um, you said something in effect of a winter opening entrance yeah. at the top. Yeah. Is that a hole we're going to put in to one of the deep boxes? Yes. It is a hole that you're going to put in the second deep, not the first. And that placement can be right below the handhold or to the side. I've, I've, uh, I've actually come to like the side because I end up in the spring, I end up putting my finger into, into the hole sometimes. And I, I like anywhere from three quarter to a full inch. Yep. And if I have, a, I have two deeps and a medium. Right. The medium I'm leaving over the winter too, obviously, right? If I get that far. Um, at the very least, you're going to leave the two deeps, okay? Um, think of that as being your core cavity. Um, the medium remains to be seen only, only from this standpoint. Um, I like to see how many bees do I really have. You might have a large hive that might require that you leave it on, okay? If it's a little bit smaller, you may not. Um, I know that sounds real mealy mouth, but that's, that's, that's one of those things that eyeball it and trust your eyes on, on that one, okay? Yeah, you got a question? I know, you said you had 100 questions. Well, I'm yeah. curious uh, what a bee's lifespan is and where, what happens are they, when they die, do they die in the hive? You said that the population increases, it plateaus, and it decreases. So where are the, the bees that are... are are no longer well, you know, in, in the beehive, for, to begin with, summer bees last about six weeks, okay? That's why that transition, when we talk, started to talk about winter bees, those are bees that actually have to last five to six months, okay? So they get a little bit different physiology. But the, in terms of bees dying, if bees are dying within your hive, you've got a major problem. Okay, because most bees actually die outside of the hive. Okay, that, and if they do die inside, they got the mortuary bees that actually pick them up and, and take them out. So that uh, actually, it's a, a, a good uh, identifier if you've got dead bees that are staying in the, in the hive, your hive is in seriously compromised position. Anybody else? Jason, we got any questions? I think he went to sleep. Uh, one, one, second. Uh, one second. Yep. Hold up. We got questions. I'm just getting them ready. Hold okay. up. And okay. So from Babette in Babylon, can I position a scale underneath my hives? and leave it to track my progress. Yes, there's all sorts of uh, portable um, scales that are available. You can, you can go right online. Um, I don't have a, a particular preference to any of them. Um, I love scale hives in a bee yard, um, especially with the number of hives that I, that I use. It is a very, very good indicator if you think you're gaining weight in your beehive, but you look at the scale and all of a sudden it says you're losing weight, 
there again, to your question about how far do I determine whether I feed them or not, again. It's a great, great thing on that one. Thanks, Jason. Uh, okay, and from Werner and Wayne Scott, can bees fly in the rain? That's Werner and Wayne Scott. Um, the answer to that, can they fly in the rain? Yes. The question, the, I mean, this is, this is about semantics. If it's a downpour, they're not going to be flying in the rain. Light drizzles, they can easily fly through. Um, but there, there comes a thing, if it's in the middle of the honey flow, I've seen them fly right, th right through a drizzle all day. Um, but if it's a dearth, a honey dearth, they may not fly at all in a, in a, in a light rain on it. But a rain of any level is an impediment to the bees in their ability to forage. Okay. And let's see, Goldie from Noyak, are the bees bothered by all this aircraft noise over their hives? How well can bees hear? Bees can't hear, okay? So they don't even have ears. So the answer to that question is aircraft don't bother them in the least, period. Okay, and uh, let's see, we have Mickey. Uh, he just wanted to tell you that he's a local over here, and he's wondering, uh, do bees ever sting other bees? Yes, uh, especially intruder bees. Um, say a yellow jacket tries to come in and uh, rob from the hive. Other, other, any, any intruder bees coming into the hive, the guard bees will sting, yes. Okay, and that's all that we have so far, and uh, we're good to go. Good. Anybody else, any other questions? What's the buzz around the audience? Okay. Scott, you're two deeps, and then you place the excluder, the queen excluder, on top of the second box, and then you put the medium on, but you do not intend to harvest any honey. All you're doing is controlling the location of the population or are you limiting it? Why would you put an excluder in at that point? Joelle, God, you've picked up the, <coughs> the great question. It's a great question. Why would I put a queen excluder? Okay, because I want to give you kind of an, an idea that one of the things about a beehive is, is that they separate their brood from their honey. Okay, it's very important to understand this now because the reason is, is that in the winter when they form this cluster, to understand the movement of bees in the winter is they always go in an upward direction. So what I try to do with a beekeeper, the goal is to keep the brood chamber down to this first box come mid-September, mid-October. So I've got everybody down low so that up here is all honey and let's just say even your medium had honey so the idea is you create where you you actually create where your brood chamber is by directing it downward with that queen excluder does that make sense to you and so during the winter the, i'm not feeding them past a certain point so i'm taking that top feeder off um, you may feed them in the winter, but you are no longer, you switch feed type. So you change from liquid to a solid, to a solid, yeah. And you may not need it, but I, I'm going to tell you something that I, we used it years ago, and, we've, and I've actually come back to it um, this past, past couple of years. Dry sugar, dry sugar is really valuable. It's a food source for the bees, but it's also a moisture wick. So it has a dual purpose on it. In fact, I actually use a lot of these, a lot of this kind of inner cover, because you see how that has a spacer, Jim? This cover will hold about six to eight pounds of sugar. Is that the winter side or the summer side? Okay, okay. This, this here, this is how it would sit on this hive during the winter. Okay, so it's the opposite, so it's the valley of the summer. This is, a, this is, 
this is not the same inner cover that you're thinking about. I know the inner cover you're thinking about. This is, this is actually designed for feed, okay? On the cover that you're talking about, it's actually just the opposite because the, the, thicker, the thicker space is, is face down for the winter, but yeah. So if I opted for a dry feed during the winter, do I need another cover or just flip over the one I have? I'll or, tell you. Or I'll, just on the top I'll tell also. you, what, uh, Michael, what I've, what I've started to do, I mean, I, I, in beekeeping, you can buy so much equipment, and yeah. at the end of the day, you know, it's like, oh my God, my, it's going to explode, okay? Here's what I like to do. I've actually started to go exclusively to these kind of covers because they f suit my need for both things. Okay, I've got, I've got, I've got the, the uh, space for them. The other kind of cool thing, you take a look, both of these, they have a hole that you can use as an upper hole. Uh, right, mine has one of those. Yep, you can, you can, yeah, but yours, yours is, is thin. thin. So the, inner co the outer cover goes right over it. So it's not useful to the bees, okay? Um, but the thing is, what I like is now I've got the cover that if I need to feed this hive, it's already there for them. That's, that's, that's all on it. If you, your inner cover there, if you created like a shim space, a half inch, three quarter inch rim, you got the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Could do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. I think we're done here, Jason. Thank you. All right, all right. Let me just get it on.